Hello to all our working preachers out there. This is Caroline Lewis. Our spring fundraising campaign is off to an amazing start, and I am grateful for all of the people who have stepped up to support our work thus far. We are relying on your support during this campaign so Working Preacher can continue to be a trusted and freely accessible source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers across the globe. A gift of $150 would provide one new narrative lectionary podcast. Any gift to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign will grant you access to additional content from the Sermon Brainwave team at upcoming Festival of Homiletics. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. Today we're doing the podcast for uh, May 14th, 2023, and our text is Romans um, chapter 3, 28 through 30, and the central text is chapter 5, 1 through 11. But if you were listening to us last week, then uh, you know that uh, the chapter 3 is uh, the rest of the story. Uh, we ended uh, last week just acknowledging that um, this uh, message was first to the Jews and then to the Greeks, and here it's uh, to the Gentiles, and uh, that's everybody. That's uh, the Jews and everybody else, because the story we've been telling had been this story from the perspective of the Jews. And so then there's the rest of the people. And so uh, starting with chapter three, as we get into this statement of justification by faith, reminds us that Jesus Christ has died for all. Ralph, you usually have a question for us. So. Jump in here, Christopher. I was waiting for you, but no, I do have a question. Um, and so let's let's talk about the um, let's. I mean, let's pick up this uh, the issue that we have. It, first of all, it is optional in the narrative lectionary to go to chapter three twenty eight through thirty. We the three of us are strongly encouraging it, for we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And then it goes on to say, um, by this, do we overthrow the law of faith? No, we uphold the law. Uh, excuse me, overthrow the law by this faith. No, we uphold the law. This, of course, is the uh, very important continuation of what it says, you know, what is the gospel? It is the power, It you know, right? It is the power of the righteousness of God. And then here we have it again. Uh, we hold that a person is justified. Now, Christopher, help us understand this term, the righteousness of God. I'm so this glad is, you're here, Christopher. Well, I guess I'm going to take it on. I was hoping you would it, do it, Ralph. Well, it actually I, doesn't happen in 328. It happens earlier, right? But right. it's... Um, no, I think it's it's a very important term. And I'm... I'm happy to take it on because one of the things that Paul is getting at here is the question of, first of all, how does one have a relationship with God? And part of the difficulty that Paul sees, part of the problem he's trying to solve is that his world, just like our world, is full of people who do not love, respect, and care for the people around them and do not love, care, and respect for their relationship with God. And so Paul is trying to say, he says this, this is in 5.6, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. So this question is, how does, do ungodly people, like he himself and all the people he know knows, relate to God? Because of the problem of God's righteousness, the problem of the fact that this God who Paul is talking about, deals kindly with all of creation and deals righteously with all of creation. And if that's the case, how can God deal a God who is righteous, a God who deals justly and kindly? How can that God relate to the ungodly? And so Paul's trying to unwind this here in chapter five 
And as we talked about, I'm going to keep coming back to this through these Romans. So you got to you got to be prepared for it. The cross of Christ is what solves this problem. The death of Christ for the ungodly, the shameful death of Christ for the ungodly. That Christ, who should not have been ashamed, became ashamed for all the people who should be ashamed. This is what solves and unwinds this problem of how God and humanity relate to each other. And so I think five is a beautiful, the beautiful way that Paul starts to tease out these, the solution to this problem that he has set up at the beginning of Romans. I like the threefold refrain in the second part of the chapter five, one through 11 reading. You, you noted one, but just note, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. This, uh, in case you have any doubt whether Paul was misspeaking the first time, he wants to make it absolutely clear. God did not wait for anybody to uh, stop being a sinner, stop being the enemy of God, or have enough strength on their own to be able to come to God. Paul is absolutely clear that all of this was the act of Christ um, before the humans in any way turned toward God. In the statement uh, that is uh, uh, in the first five verses of chapter five, uh, where we begin this, we get this sense of that um, we are um, boasting in our suffering, knowing that it in, it produces a, a endurance, and that it produces character, and that produces hope, and that hope does not disappoint us. All of that is about this hope, that we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. So as you've just identified, before we have the restored capacity to bear the image of God, which is what we were created to do, before we stop being the enemies of God, those who keep walking out of the story God is narrating us into, before we did what was right in the name of God, God, for our sake, glorified himself that we would be made right through Jesus Christ. So this whole thing is our hope to become, or I'm going to use the word, to be restored to what we were created to be. And so even as we're reading this text, we aren't there yet. Paul is saying, we still have this hope to be glorified in God. Um, I think that bears some, some uh, recognition today because um, we sometimes forget and think that we've we've arrived as soon as we say I believe. We still have a journey to go. That's uh, I, I, thank you so much. I'd like to say two things uh, to uh, in, in conversation with that. The first thing I want to say is, uh, and, and Christopher and I got in trouble last fall when we taught a class together. Some. Uh, at a certain point, we were so often so critical of the uh, NRSV translation that I think some of the students decided no translation was acceptable, and therefore, could you actually even know the Word of God? So we went, maybe we were too far. I do get a little worried when they sneak words in there. So when I look at the Greek, the word share is not in there. So we we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, mm. you tell me if I'm just wrong about that, Christopher. Now, so I think it's trying to take the date of relationship and say, what does it mean to hope in the glory of God or something like that, Christopher? Help me out. Yeah, is which share verse is this again? Five. Uh, no, verse two. Yes, the end of verse two. Right. It says... And we boast um, in our hope of sharing oh. the glory of God. That's what it says in the RSV. But well, the word sharing, I don't see it in the Greek unless I'm missing it. But that's why I asked my New Testament colleague. Right, I tell this to my Greek students all the time. If you don't see it, it's usually not because you're missing it. <laughs> it's usually because somebody has added it. 
And this is a case of this where they're trying to clarify, I, to put the best construction on the right. translator of the NRSV. They're trying to clarify what it very literally says. We boast in hope of the glory of God. And so the question is, of course, what does it mean in the hope of the glory of God? They've construed it in this kind of, we will share in that glory in some ways. Uh, and I think that is one way you can construe that. I think you can also think of it, uh, you, we can hope in, or we boast in the hope that uh, God will reveal glory. And the Paul's uh, letters are kind of suffused with this apocalyptic language about the revelation of glory. So that's another way we can uh, read this. But it, it's important to know that when we translate, we often have to make decisions about how we try to get across what we think is going on in the original text. So I think that's a great example of that there. I, I also want to put out one other thing. Joy, I think this is what you were saying, um, that this, this um, sequence that Paul names, we boast in our sufferings. Okay, nobody in the ancient world boasts in their sufferings. We boast in our sufferings. Uh, he says, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, but that hope is back to the glory of God, as your point is. I also want to say this sequence is not normative for all suffering. This is, I don't think Paul is saying, hey, all suffering produces character or endurance, and all endurance produces character, and all. It, he doesn't mean that way. It, uh, he certainly, uh, certain people who are suffering at certain points in their life, especially at the end of their life, it's not producing endurance or character. Um, you know, so just uh, I get worried because some people I hear make this a, a, a try. This is how you do these things. It's this, you know, it's sort of the, this sequence of suffering. And I just want to warn against that and do what you did, Joy, and point out that Christian hope is a particular hope in the glory of God. Thank you for that, because, yeah, I, I also do not want to suggest that sequencing, um, uh, but I do want to hold to the fact that it is the hope in the glory of God. That's the conversation that this is about. And that circles back with what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks about what is happening here in Rome. And what is Paul saying that is disruptive to this, um, this imp imp empire's way of thinking? Could I get a little bit technical about our Greek text right oh, now? Please. Because we already got into it. One of the oh, things... I, I hope you're going to talk about verse one. No, I'm going to talk about this boasting and this okay, suffering. So one of the things that... Uh, Paul is notable for, and that makes him somewhat hard to read, is he loves parallel clauses. And what I mean by that is he'll say one thing, and then he'll say another thing that is related to it. Right. Right. But here's one of the difficulties, and this is one of the things that is very hard for us as English speakers to understand about Greek, is that very often the second clause in the parallelism is meant to recapitulate something in the first clause. But in Greek, you can leave the words out. So he says, we boast in our hope of sharing the glory. We boast in our hope of the glory of God. And then he says, not only that, but we also boast, and I think you should read there, parentheses, in the hope of the glory of God through our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance endurance produces character and character produces hope. He very often does this where he'll leave out the thing that you as the reader are supposed to supply. And I think, again, it's not two different kinds of boasting. It's both boasting in the glory of God and one, this boasting in the hope of the glory of God has a particular result. So again, that's a little bit technical, but I think it's important. This is going to show up again and again as you read Romans, are these parallel clauses where something is left out of the second one that you have to go back and say, wait a second, this needs to be added there so we understand the argument Paul is making. I think this Maybe. is 
important also, Christopher, because it um, it prevents the reading that Rolf was cautioning us against, mm-hmm. because it is centering this on the hope and the glory of God. And by putting it back in, it becomes central again, as mm-hmm. opposed to our reading, which acts as if, as you were just saying, a different kind of hope, a different kind of boasting, and that boasting is in, and that's the reading that we do not want people to take. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could close uh, with just two final things that build on um, what you've been saying here. And that is verse one of chapter five. Of five. Why did I think you were going to go there? We have peace with God. Uh, there is a, a there's there's a question about that translation, but take uh, take uh, my word for it, which you don't have to, of course. Read up on it. Uh, there's lots of places. Paul is saying we already have this, and he makes it clear in what he, what we've already talked about. While we were, while we were, while we are, we have peace with God. If you have any doubt that you have peace with God. Go to this verse. Uh, God is not your enemy. Uh, God is not eager to condemn you to hell. We have peace with God because we're justified by faith through Jesus Christ.